There we go. Fish. It's a fantastic natural food and one that takes pride of place on the river cottage table. But many of our favourite fish, such as cod and haddock, are now under huge ecological pressure. And if we want to keep eating fish, we need to be more responsible in the way we catch it and more adventurous in the fish we choose to cook. So I'm off on a fishy fact-finding tour to discover as much as I can about the modern marine harvest. And obviously, I'm hoping to knock up some sensational fish feasts along the way. Over the next three weeks, I'm going to scour the British Isles for an alternative, more sustainable fish menu. First stop, the Channel Islands, where I'll be grappling with gurnard and garfish, searching for the new smoked salmon, and just to give my appetite an edge, snorkeling with sharks. My fishy fact-finding foray starts in Weymouth, Britain's busiest angling port. And to help me put some fish on the plate, I've teamed up with a couple of old fishing pals. How are you? Very nice to see you. Yeah. Very excited, I am. All right, Pat. The aptly named Nick Fisher and Weymouth skipper Pat Carlin are two of my favourite people to fish with. And for sheer diversity, one of our favourite places to fish is the Channel Islands, a few hours steaming south of Weymouth. But before night falls, there's just enough time to have a go at catching our supper. That would tempt any self-respecting fish of almost any species you'd have thought. We're going ragworm on the top, mackerel on the bottom, a bit of an insurance policy. With our hooks heaving with irresistible bait, we drop over the side and down to the bottom to see who'll bag the first fish of the trip. If you had to bet this boat, this beautiful boat, on what was going to be the first species we catch, Pat? Pelting. It has to it be. It looked like there was some pelt in there just coming on the feed. How do you know they're just coming on the feed? It's tea time. It is. It's I tell you what, I'm just coming on the feed. With only a few basics on board, we're gambling on a fish supper. And not for the first time, Pat's prediction is right on the money. A pair of pouting. Oh. How about that? I might have landed the first pair, but Pat and Nick are hot on my heels. Wow. That is a beauty. Look at the two of you, eh? And their fish are bigger than both of mine put together. First fish of the trip. And who's the one with a little bit of fish envy today? Could be me. Well, that's a sort of a tea, really, isn't it? Pouting is one of the most underrated fish in our waters. Its delicate white fillets are lovely in breadcrumbs or batter and make great fish cakes. But you must keep it well iced and eat it super fresh. They don't come much fresher than the pair that Nick's about to sort for our supper. The fish are descaled, and with just a few deft strokes of the knife, the fillets are good to go. And I'm sure they'll be worthy of a homemade tartar sauce. Diced gherkins and capers go into a bowl with two finely chopped hard-boiled eggs. In goes a large handful of finely chopped parsley and a few good dollops of homemade mayonnaise. With a squeeze of fresh lemon juice and a twist of black pepper, the sauce is ready to go, and so am I. Anglers are often very disparaging about pouting, mainly because it's a fish that they keep on catching whenever they're trying to catch something else. But as far as the eating goes, it's actually seriously underrated. It's a member of the cod family with lovely white, delicate flesh and certainly extremely worthy of the time-honoured egg and breadcrumb treatment. The fillets are first rolled in well-seasoned flour, then dipped in beaten eggs and covered in a good layer of fresh breadcrumbs. They go into a shallow frying pan of hot oil for just a few minutes on each side until they're nicely golden brown. That looks crispy and delicious. Not bad for the trashiest fish in the sea, is it? Absolutely. With tartar sauce on the side and a wedge of lemon, it's time to tuck into our first fish supper of the trip. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Great tartar sauce as well. What do you think, Pat? It's gorgeous. Hard to understand when you taste that why pout is not a more popular eating fish. But it's so fresh. I mean, that we've got that at an absolute peak condition. I can't think of a better way to set the agenda for finding out some mm. more about some fish we don't eat much. And if that's the worst one we're going to eat, then we're like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not unhappy. The pouting soon polished off, and we're away to our bunks to dream of fish to come. I'm on a journey to explore the lesser known fish resources of the British Isles. And after a nighttime crossing from Weymouth, my companions and I have arrived in the Channel Islands. These craggy islands are blessed with tidal rips, rocks and sandbanks that are some of the fishiest in all Europe. I'm hoping we'll catch some unusual but delicious species that aren't always appreciated elsewhere in Britain. But before we go fishing, we need to get some supplies in. So Nick and I have disembarked to recce the island for various goodies. I've got an appointment with Guernsey biker Rob Steen. And if there's one thing he loves almost as much as his Harley Davidson, it's his local produce. So leaving Nick to check out the town, I'm in for a high-speed shopping trip in pursuit of fresh fruit and veg for the boat's galley. Guernsey has a long and trusting tradition of hedge veg, garden surplus grown by the islanders and sold on unmanned roadside stalls. Well, hey, this looks good. Some nice looking stuff here. Yep. Good broad beans. Lovely. You help That's yourself. Nice. I'll need a few of those. Do the maths. It's got all the 50p. And put your money in the honesty box. That's the box. Yep. It's a great feeling, especially at 60 miles an hour. There you go. Beautiful. Mm. I think we're buying, aren't we? I think so, yep. And with a stall round almost every bend, we're spoilt for choice. While I'm stocking up on veg, Nick is hunting down another Guernsey culinary tradition. Aha! The fishmongers. This is number one. Give it a go in here. It's a mysterious concoction known as chervy. Wow! Oh, you've got some great stuff in there. Gold dust. Look at that! Chili flavoured oil. You know, I'd be tempted to put a little bit of that in. Ooh, a blender. Back at the harbour, my veggie haul is on its way to the galley, and I'm about to find out the secrets of a classic Channel Island chervy. First, chop your not very fresh fish, skeletons and heads, into bite-sized pieces. Then pound together the fish, brine and chilli oil with a giant pestle and mortar. Transfer some of the mixture into a blender. It's delicious. Stir this fishy puree back into the rough mixture. Just get it in. Just go on. And leave to stand in a warm place for half an hour to fester. Finally, decant into an old onion sack and throw the whole lot overboard. Thank goodness it's not on our menu, but we're hoping that the fallout from this gourmet ground bait will prove irresistible to one particular species of fish. I'm targeting garfish in a very focused way. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. The garfish, or long nose, may look scary, but its light oily flesh makes a great alternative to mackerel. Found throughout the UK, it's rarely caught commercially as its bright green bones are often viewed with suspicion. But here in the Channel Islands, it's long been a respected eating fish. And we're keen to have a go at catching and cooking some ourselves. So, Hugh, where are these garfish? I mean, we're giving it all we can. Yeah. 
And what does that tell you? Something wrong with your chervy. Ah, look. What do you got there? Hey! Oh, but here comes another one. Whee! Oh, yeah, I've had one of them. You've had one of those? Yeah. Two different species. <laughs> yes. <one>. Yeah. <laughs> but after two hours of catching nothing but seaweed, we need a change of tack. So we head to the harbour in search of inspiration. Many of Guernsey's garfish are caught from the shore. Hello! Any garfish? And when we arrive at the main pier looking for a few friendly tips, the local gar fishing prowess is already on display. Hey! Well, wow. wow, that's one more than we caught, isn't it? <laughs> With no further invitation needed, we're up on the pier to learn from the locals. Uh, hey! Two was so that you we saw reeling in that garfish? Yeah, I've got two so far. You've two. got two? Yeah. Oh, wow. Now, are they average size for here, or are they small, or...? Um, they're about average. A good one's over a pound. Yeah, quite... Look at even the scales yeah, through that green-blue colour, don't they? Yeah. They stick like glue. Mm. And when you do eat garfish, how do you normally cook them? Uh, grill them. Grill them. Whole or filleted? Uh, no, whole. Well, cut the head off. Having finally met our elusive prey, we're determined to land one ourselves. Oh, oh hang on, is he going to run over my float? But it's the locals who are leading the way. That's a fish. Now he's on. Fish. 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 Oh, I got it. Yes. It's a, big, it's a good sized one, too. Here he comes. <laughs> so. Fantastic. Garfish in space, that was, wasn't it? Wow. Oh, oh. Oh, the big one, the good size That's a crack. Oh, oh. Yes. Oh. You. Uh, Three. Sweet little pollock. <laughs> it's no garfish, but at least Nick's managed to break our Guernsey duck. Oh, 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 oh. I went too early, did I? Uh, he didn't wait for it. With the long nose, you've got to wait for him because, they, because they've got such a long beak. Really? You've got to wait for him to chew it a bit. Yeah. Oh, that was a close one. My future as a gar fisherman isn't looking too promising. But I'm darned if we're not going to taste one. So we snaffle our new friend's catch in return for an invitation to dinner and hope that we can redeem ourselves in the kitchen. Nick's got the garfish gig and sets about preparing our pilfered haul. The fish are descaled and gutted and their heads removed. Into a well-oiled baking tray goes a layer of parboiled potatoes, sliced onions, roughly chopped garlic and some chunks of fresh lemon. The garfish pieces are rubbed with more garlic and laid on top of the spud bed. Extra aromatics come from a few bay leaves and a couple of sprigs of thyme. Over goes a sprinkling of salt, a good trickle of olive oil and a good squeeze of lemon juice. The whole thing goes into a hot oven for half an hour. Meanwhile, I'm preparing an escabeche with Yusuf, one of my pier fishing chums. But there's not enough garfish for us, so we're falling back on that reliable summer staple, mackerel. What you can do is you can do a bit of bashing and a bit of hard stirring, and that should dry The fish are rolled in a coating of freshly ground cumin, coriander and caraway seeds. That's it, just roll it over. That's it, you've got it. Nice little stripe down each side. After a liberal sprinkling of paprika, the spiced mackerel are gently sizzled in a pan of hot oil for a couple of minutes on each side. The fish come out and into the hot pan go the leftover ground spices, some more crushed garlic and some sliced onions. A few bay leaves go in along with another pinch of the three spices. What are they called again? Human, coriander and caraway. Brilliant. Along with a glass of wine, a pinch of sugar and salt and a slug of cider vinegar. This aromatic piquant sauce simmers for just five minutes before being poured hot over the mackerel and left to finish cooking them as it cools down. And that, Yusef, is the finished dish, escabeche of mackerel. It especially smells really, really nice. Our dinner guests are no strangers to mackerel or garfish, 
but I'm hoping that they might not have had them done quite like this before. The point about both these underrated fish is that they're not only delicious, but incredibly versatile. Thank you very much. Can I that? Yeah, I can. Whoa. Sue, my love. Thank you very much. You got a knife and fork? I have a kiss. Right? Right then. Much whiter than mackerel, isn't it? Yeah. That's good here. I've never, I've never eaten it. Was that the first time you've eaten a garfish? For the very first time. Is it? Oh, what do you think? I can't even get the bones Good. Out. Tasty. Those, bo those bones really are green, aren't they? They yeah. are indeed. There's mm -hmm. quite a lot along the belly strips. They're good, the belly strips. Mm. 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 Slightly rich in meat, isn't it, the belly? Mm. Slightly... Yeah, I've got a lot of time for garfish. I think... It's better you can't catch them. <laughs> and as the sun sets, I'm already planning future sessions with the green-boned gar back home in the River Cottage kitchen. So I to start. After saying good night to our dinner guests, so we're I'm unwinding with a round or two of scrabble. Steady. Nearest day start, turn. Fish scrabble, of course. D, that's me. Double word score. Mm, nice. Mm. Twelve. Pod. But a pod is happen. Pod of fish. A pod, pod like pod, a pod, pod of dolphins. Pod of dolphins. Yeah, but they're mammals. Well, yeah, pod, pod. of tarpon. Brine. That's what? brilliant. Krill. That's a class. Very nice. I think bunk is pretty spurious. Well, where are you going to sleep tonight, Hugh? I'm a bunk on a boat, but I mean... On what kind of boat are you on? Uh, a catamaran. And its purpose? Is to sail the ocean blue. And <laughs> catch fish. <laughs> I like slime. And gentlemen, that gives me the lead. Not eel again. That looks like a killer. Cut him up. You are the fishiest. Well done. <laughs> well done, Dick. Next morning, we're planning an early start to the day's fishing. But an impenetrable channel fog has swallowed our boat. This is very spooky, Nick, isn't it? Very. Can you just see the shape of a boat? Through yeah, the mist yeah. Out it's all very yacht, Mary isn't Celeste, it? isn't it? Absolutely. We might even go back into the wheelhouse and find Pat's gone. There's just a smoking roll-up in the ashtray. <laughs> He's disappeared. As the fog finally clears enough to get our rods out, we spot a totally different kettle of fish heading straight for us. Look at that. Yeah, superb. It's a basking shark. A four-ton feeding machine. In early summer, these sharks often appear in the channel with one thing on their minds. Dinner. Do you know what? I quite fancy getting a wetsuit on, a mask and snorkel, and seeing how close I can get. Really? At up to 30 foot long, the basking shark is the second largest fish in the world, pipped to the title only by the whale shark. I've never swum with anything this big, and as I slip into the water, I can't quite stop my heart from pounding. As it approaches, I realise that this monster could easily swallow me whole. But luckily, I'm not on the menu today. Basking sharks prefer microscopic plankton to wetsuited snorkelers and their summer feeding trips to British waters are a heartening sign of the health and fertility of our seas. Nonetheless, this is an awesome beast, and I'd better not forget that a single flick of its tail could send me straight back to Dorset. Fantastic! That was absolutely brilliant. He's vast. Absolutely vast. Is that the first time you've been down with a, a basking shark? It's the first time I've been down. It's the first time I've been that close to any shark. Absolutely brilliant. An inspiring sight, and I can only take it as an omen of the all-round fishiness of our time here. 
I wonder what's next on the menu. Superb. Really, really enjoyed it. Cheers. Cup of coffee? Uh, yeah, I love it. Have a tea. Warm, you need a, a bit of warm up, mate. Our quest for the ultimate in underappreciated seafood has brought me and my fishing friends Pat and Nick to Alderney in the Channel Islands. We want to catch and cook as many different species as we can and to add spice to that challenge, a little competition is in order with help from local anglers Dick and Mark. Hi guys, how are you doing? It's to be boat versus shore and the team catching the most species wins. Pat and I make up the boat team and head out among Alderney's races and sandbanks. Meanwhile, Nick and his two local shore guides are going rock hopping. So Pat, we got three, well, two and a half hours. What's the tactic? We're on the top of the tide at the moment, the ebb tide. And we'll spend the next 40 minutes for a bass. Nick's first target is the grey mullet. Though plentiful around British shores, it's a tough fish to catch, so it's a favourite challenge among sport anglers like Dick and Mark. And although it's very delicious, it's rarely eaten. We'd love to eat one, but if that's going to happen, Nick will need chervy, patience, skill, and a bit more patience. To catch a bass, on the other hand, you just need a skipper like Pat. Fish on! You're on. Well, hey. Pat Bass opens the scoring for the boat team. We're up and running. Only a small one. Well done, Pat. All right. And I'm not far behind. I'm in. I'm in. Well, hey. <laughs> what have we got? It's a Pollock. It's a Pollock. Things are much quieter on the shore, so Dick's going out on a rocky limb in pursuit of the elusive mullet. I'm in. Oh, yes. <laughs> Two species up, and we're scouting for a pouting. It feels pollocky. But our old friend the pollock keeps getting there first. Another nice little pollock. Had a mullet gloat line. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, bass and pollock gloat line. Mm-hmm. Pat has been very clever and he's got us among the fish. And he's winkled out a lovely bass himself. And uh, I've winkled out. In fact, I can't stop catching pollock. We're trying to catch a pout to get another species on board. I'm just full of joy for you. So, so how's it going your end? In terms of fish catching, nothing. You know, Nick, I'd love to stay and chat, but I've got something on the other line. Bye. So what's you had then? I just can't seem to get through the pollock to catch anything else. That's really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Whereas we haven't even got a barrel yet. Scrape. <laughs> yes, good old mackerel. A brace of obliging mackerel puts the boat team 3-0 up. And back on shore, things are getting a bit desperate. I've just moved a little bit out of the way, leave the experts to, to concentrate. My chances of catching a seagull are probably much higher than catching a mullet. Yes! Yes! Oh, yes! Are you gone? Come on, look. There you go, Nick. It's all yours. Yes! Well oh, that is a beauty! Yes. That is a very good fish. Thanks, oh, you. Dick, well done, man. Ah, oh, eat your heart out, Fernie Whittingstall. <laughs> he's not got a mullet. I don't care how far out to sea he goes, he's not got a mullet like this. That's a beautiful fish. Yeah. Well done, look at this. This is a great fish and it's a great fish to eat. And respect to mullet and all that. You're on a mission. Yeah? <laughs> You're happy with that? Yeah. Right, I'm going for garfish now. Yeah. And as the tide turns, so finally does Nick's luck. I'm not even sure what it is. What do you think it is, guys? It's a mackerel. It's a huge fish. A last-minute flourish from the shore team draws the contest to a close. And as both teams head back to harbour, it's looking like a very tight finish. 
Hey, well, you've all got big grins on your faces. Oh, so, sure we have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, so I've got a bucket. Good. Oh, We've yeah. got a We've big got a cool box. box. You've got a cool box. I'll spill our catch on the key. There we go. Oh. That's a good attempt. That's getting close. Yeah, it's close, close. Yeah. Out. So what have you got in your box? Yeah, because <laughs> this was a mullet day, so we've got... Oh, my God. A big oh mullet. Oh, my God. That's an absolute beauty. A big mullet. Oh, that is spectacular. We've got a... Garfish, which I don't think you've got any garfish down there, have you? And we've got a mackerel too. Oh! In fact, we have to be perfectly honest, we don't just have one mullet. Both of our mullet maestros delivered the goods. I must say, that is a fantastic catch from the shore. Uh -huh. Just look at that. Look at so, that. how many species? Three. 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 And how many um, species have we got? Uh, there's three there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, right. Right. Hey, Call that out of the Sandio bucket. No, no, no. That is a genuine Alderney launce. Yeah. This was caught wriggling on the end of a mackerel feather when we were dropping for the mackerel. Six hooks. Yeah. Six, six hooks. Yeah, six we were six, only yeah. fishing one all yeah, at a time. We are. Um, it was. You, oh. and and say, I think it was, a, it was an open contest. No, no rules. There was, no there was rules. nothing open about it. <laughs> the only thing open about it was all, all the sea around your boat. <laughs> we may have won by a launce, but launce, mullet and pollock aren't the most valued trio in the kitchen. But resourcefulness is second nature on Alderney, and we've heard of a resident Scotsman who might just help us turn these less fated fish into something special. Isn't that wonderful? Absolutely brilliant. John Craig has constructed Alderney's finest amateur fish smoker. This triumph of salvage upholds an ancient tradition of cold smoking fish to preserve it. Though in these days of fridges and freezers, we smoke fish for pleasure more than practical necessity. You can see the smoke is starting to issue out here, and it runs along here on this pipe, and it cools as it gets towards the end there. And you end up with cold smoking. So you may lightly this, salted you fish, whole or in fillets, yes, is okay. placed in the chamber and immersed in the cool smoke for several hours. Ah, this completes the cure and gives it an irresistible smoky flavour. Wow! The pollock, the pollock, yes, yeah. they are. beautiful. Can I just have a? Of course. I mean, they really are quite cool. They yes. look wonderful, don't they? Beautiful golden colour. Three quarters done, I should think. We need to take your advice on whether you think with this mullet. This would be better filleted, wouldn't it? It would. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it would. And scaled. Scaled and filleted. Yes. And we thought... Oh, wonderful. Have you ever smoked a garfish before? No. Garfish. Would you think we could do him whole, or would we have to fillet him? I think maybe whole. A oh. bit slit, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Launce. How about that? An Alderney launch. Ever tried him before? No. Uh -huh. What do you think? Any good? Yeah, could be. It might be the discovery of the century. <laughs> <laughs> Nick and I get to work filleting, descaling, salting, and stacking our unorthodox catch, ready for an overnight cure in John's smoker. And we'll be back in a day or two to see if it's worked its magic. The following morning, our non-fishy supplies are running low. <laughs> so Nick and I have tracked down the best place on Alderney to shop for our greens. Oh, look at this. With a combination of continental sunshine and British rainfall, St Mary's Market Garden in the heart of Alderney is a veg lover's delight. It's beautiful. It's like a runner bean forest. And we're like kids in a sweet shop. It's a lovely way to get your vegetables, isn't it? Fantastic. Especially some with fresh produce like this. Do you think we should have a prize for the comedy bean? Well, I don't think you'd have brought that up unless you thought you had a contender, frankly. <laughs> oh, is that it's it? A, I think I can it's do... A, it's a lobster claw bean. You think you can beat that? I've actually beaten your lobster claw bean with an even lobstery Gloria bean. I don't think so. I think so. I don't think Mine's so. Mine's more pincy and nippy. <laughs> That's a fish hook bean. OK. And that is... A launce. <laughs> That's quite good, actually. Once again, the launce claims victory. But it's time to stop playing with our food and start picking it. Mm. 
And with this profusion of good things, we're spoilt for choice. Wonderful fresh parsley. Mmm. Oh, you did well, didn't you? Nice onions. Really good. We've got lots of goodies here, Brian, but we haven't been very rational. Um, this is all herbs. Do you need to weigh those? No, that'll be fine. We do them by the bunch anyway. So do you? We'll How many that, bunches is that? We'll call that two bunches. Two bunches? Yeah. I think you're being very generous. Very generous. What about the beans? Do you do them by the bunch? Well, they're by the pound, so we'll do... Uh, we'll just... You've got about a pound there. Well, he's got about the same... I've got about the same there, so that's two pounds. Okay. And how many courgettes onions, have you got? Four, uh, you've, got you've got two pounds of courgettes there. And onions? And I've uh, got two pounds of... Uh, Onions? Isn't it amazing it, that everything it, we've got weighs exactly two pounds? <laughs> it's just easier in the head, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's easier on your head. I'm not sure about my head. What do you think? Are you going to give us a grand total? I want to give you a grand total of um, um, 450. Wow. Bargain. Really? Yeah. Bargain. Bargain. Superb. Right. Excellent. Lovely. Not sure I've got 450. <laughs> actually. Veg in hand, we're back on board in search of more lovely fish for tonight's supper. Oh, yes. And Nick's hooked himself a spectacular specimen. What is it? It's a gurnard. Wow. Look at that. What a fish. Red gurnard is another classic example of an abundant but underrated species. Well done. Very nice. Despite its exotic, almost alien appearance, it makes fantastic eating and we'll take all we can get. Hey, it's gurnard city. Pretty much a matching pair. Here we are. got a bream here, Hugh. Have you just? Sea bream, loved by the French, but still not widely appreciated in Britain. Wow, that's a lovely fish, isn't it? I reckon sea bream, or black bream, is about as good as sea fish gets. And with a brace of them to go with our trio of gurnard, we're all set for dinner. Now, the gurnard is something that's never particularly been popular on the fishmonger slab, never been that popular with chefs. It lives on the bottom, it's a bit ugly. Anglers have always caught them and not necessarily really known what to do with them. But it's a lovely fish with a tremendous amount of top quality meat on it. Gurnard is an outstanding fish with firm, rich flesh somewhere between monkfish and bass. It holds together in soups and stews, but is also delicious foil-wrapped and baked whole. It's generally a real bargain, though it may not be for long. So I'm just snipping off all the fins and spines, and you can see why you'd want to get rid of that. The fins off, the nasty points off those gill plates just snipped off. And a good scrub with the descaler. With the fish trimmed and descaled, the guts go. come out, it gets a good rinse, and it's into the galley to make a gurnard and vegetable hot pot. Into a pan of softened onions and garlic go chunks of leek, celery, carrots, and potatoes. A couple of sprigs of thyme and a few fish-friendly bay leaves go in too. The point is to build a nice base of veg up, arrange the fish over the top, close it all up and bake it so that those fishy juices and the vegetables all mingle together and then you take it out the oven and it's ready to eat. A dash of oil and a knob of butter helps draw the juices out of the veg as they sweat gently. It's seasoned with a pinch of salt and plenty of pepper. Half a glass of wine goes in, and the other half into the pot. And when the veg are juicy and almost tender, in goes the fish. The whole thing bakes in a hot oven for half an hour. Back on deck, Nick's getting to grips with the bream. Black bream, or wild sea bream, is one of the tastiest fish in our waters, and far superior to its farmed cousins. It's a winner however you cook it, but simple is best. So fry fillets, bake or barbecue whole small fish, or eat raw, either as sashimi or marinated, as in a South American ceviche. For this, the fish are filleted, skinned and sliced, then covered in a marinade of lime juice, which starts off a kind of cooking process. Orange and lemon juice complete the citrus marinade, and then into the mix, goes finely sliced celery, some chopped spring onion, a few slithers of freshly chopped chilli, and a sprinkling of coriander leaves. Finally, a pinch of sugar and salt, 
and it just needs to stand for an hour to let that marinade work its magic. Ceviche maestro. First, first course. Superb. It looks beautiful, Nick. And you've got to have lots of the looks beautiful. lots of the marinade with it as well, and yeah. drink that afterwards. Have you had this before, Pat? Yes, we we've done it down at the cottage with yeah, we've had bream, it a couple bream, of times bream and bass mixture. It's nice to do bream and bass. This is just pure bream. And what's extraordinary is that the fish is cooked. It's cooked. You know, and it really it's like rare tuna. Yeah, like Look. seared. Tuna, it's sort of seared by the juice and just raw in the mm. middle. Mm. I mean, it's, it's absolutely perfect, Nick. This Good is enough. gorgeous. Mm. Yeah. From the raw to the cooked, and under a setting sun as red as a gurnard, the hot pot is served. Look at that. Texture of that meat is tremendous. Chicken of the sea? Yeah. Mm. It's juicy, isn't it? But you know, what, what, what would you say? It's as good as any bream, really, isn't it? Right up there, wouldn't it? And so, red gurnard and black mm. bream mm. are proudly added to our growing list of fish we should do more with. I'm on the Channel Island of Alderney, searching for lesser-known foodie riches from the sea and for the best ways of making them taste great. Our competition catch has had a good 12 hours in John Craig's cold smoker and it's getting a final blast in time for our smoky breakfast. Wow. We've smoked an unusual range of fish from the highly prized sea bass to the lowly launce and we're going to taste and compare them all. What a smorgasbord. And shall I have a little go at the sea bass? Yes. Let's see that one. I think it's wonderful. I can't wait to sample <laughs> this fish. This is amazing looking. The bass has come out perfectly, John. I've got the mullet here, and this is also looking really nice. Should we try the bass first? Mm. I, think, I think that's lovely. Very delicate. Mm. The luxury really bass like tastes as good as it looks. Well, so, marks out of ten for the bass? Very high, I think. Nine. Yeah. Nine, I'd, I'd go along with that. Now the garfish. It's time to see how the less exalted species are bearing up. It hasn't quite got the sweetness of the bass. Mm. How many points do you think? Six and a half. Six and a half. Yeah, yeah do you agree? Yeah, I do. Let's go for the launce. These chubby sand eels aren't scarce, but will they mount a challenge to the bass? Is it the discovery of the century, John? No. No, it isn't, is it? I think we have to, oh. we have to face it. Uh, I'm going to pull my money out of this launch. <laughs> <laughs> Sell launch. Sell launch. Smoked <laughs> Pollock scores a creditable eight. Mullet. Mm. And the final mullet. contender is the hard-won grey mullet. I think that's really pleasant. Mm. It's, got a, it's got the sweetness again, hasn't it? It's just got the firmness yeah. and the sweetness. The mullet's excellent flavour puts it gill and gill with the bass. So it's down to a show of hands as a tiebreaker. One, two, three, boat. Ooh. Ooh. John's gone left for bass. Bass, mullet, mullet. Yeah, mullet wins. Victory for the modest mullet, proving that with a bit of ingenuity, even the most unassuming fish can give our luxury favourites a run for their money. Grey mullet is a great favourite on Mediterranean and Chinese menus, but in Britain it's valued more by anglers than cooks, and the cooks are definitely missing out. The firm flesh makes great chunky cutlets for putting in stews and casseroles, and it's a revelation when cold smoked. Thank you, keep sending them in. <laughs> the islanders have always made the most of the rich resource of the sea and the shore, and their old traditions have produced some quirky seafood items on the Alderney menu. Yeah, how are you? How are you doing? Juan, well, well, we've teamed up with a trio of particularly wily locals. Two Steve's. Yeah, two Steve's. Double Steve. We can do some low water fishing. Low water yeah, fishing, I like the sound of that. And they've agreed to show us how to forage for fish, Alderney style. You know where we're going? Absolutely no idea. The island may be less than four miles long, but it has over 30 miles of coastline. And if you know where to look, there's more seafood on the average beach than in any city fishmongers. And it's free to those in the know. Ooh, ooh, you're right. Our guides have brought us to the curiously named Clonk, 
Mm. Where the two Steves are introducing Nick to an old favourite. He's off. Yeah. The limpet. Let's just quickly see. They can pickle them. Yeah. Pickle I remember limpet. my aunts going to my aunts as a small boy and um, uh, bringing out the limpets, pickled uh, limpets with bread. Really? Yeah, Special treat. Yep. Bring out the pickled limpets. That's right. We used to take the head, the, the head out. Right. Just eat the rubbery foot. Yep. Did yep. you? Yeah, fine. Should I, I try one? Try one. It won't hurt. Should I? Yeah. Try half, with me. <laughs> Try half with me. Good man. <laughs> the limpet is a plentiful but largely unloved mm. seafood. It's found on rocky beaches everywhere, and provided the water's mm. clean, it's an instant raw seaside snack. It's quite nice, actually. Salty. Mm, it tastes of iron and. It's like sweet taste, really. Mm, it has. Not bad at all. I've teamed up with Juan, the local marine biologist, who brings a touch of Spanish shellfish savvy to the beach. With most of his rock pool finds, oh, look at that. it's a toss-up between studying them the anemone. and swallowing them. We can't eat that, can we? It's a special dish in Cadiz, actually. It's, really? Uh, it's That's where really, you're from? That's where I'm from, from the south of Spain, Cadiz. In Spain we call it ortiguillas. Okay. Ortiguillas mean like stinging nettles. Ah, it's like stinging nettles. Yeah. Oh. Because it and stings when they're alive. Will you get stung in the mouth if you eat one? No. You sure? Absolutely. That I would really like to try. With a few more of these snake lock anemones in the bag, we've assembled the makings of an unusual al fresco lunch. Nick and the Steves have got to work cooking the limpets in their own shells in a garlic and parsley butter. Juan is preparing a Spanish style limpet stew with a base of garlic and onion, tomato, peppers, and chorizo. I'm on anemone duty. They're simply rolled in seasoned flour and dropped into sizzling hot oil. Wow! Steve and Steve, how excited are you about the anemones? Uh, not very excited. Not very good. Not very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. How are they? Oh, I'm gonna like that. Something else. Mmm, extraordinary. It's almost tomato -y. Mm. That's really nice. Mm. After a couple of minutes in Juan's stew pot, the limpets start to come away from their shells, with a little bit of help from scalded fingers. And from the most unpromising ingredients, we've conjured up a revelationary rock pool repast. Extraordinary, what a great place. I'll drink to that. Mm. Cheers. Inspired by our delicious limpet lunch, we've decided to return the favour and invite some of our Alderney friends to a farewell beach barbecue. But of course, we'll have to catch the main ingredients. Yeah, look. Oh, it's, a, it's a full house. Blimey, look at him. Line caught mackerel is the feel good fish. It's sustainable, delicious, highly versatile, and full of good healthy oils. It has to be eaten super fresh and it's usually excellent value. And when it's this fresh, Very tasty. it's perfect for two of the dishes I want to make for tonight's beach party. This is a wonderful, highly aromatic oriental dish based on a Japanese recipe for salmon. But it works extremely well with mackerel and it's about three really intense flavors, ginger, garlic, and chili. Three liquids as well, plenty of soy sauce, vinegar. That's where the sour comes in. And a good splosh of apple juice. That's just to add a little bit of sweetness and a little bit of fruitiness and also just to sort of dilute the vinegar and the soy otherwise they'd be too intense. Right now the fish go in. Lovely fresh mackerel. Just taking the heads and the tails off which means the guts come out really easily and a good sprinkling of sugar. So far what we've got in here is going to make my mackerel sweet, sour and highly aromatic. But the one thing it's not yet is hot, and that's where this comes in. One whole red chilli, one whole green chilli, that's really hot, that's a nice warm fruity one, and lethally, a little dried one goes in as well. While my mackerel is simmering away in the galley, a final flurry of fishing adds to the haul for our barbecue. Then it's back to shore to celebrate the last evening of our Channel Island jaunt. While Nick's on barbecue, I'm preparing another of my mackerel favourites. I'm stuffing them with salsa verde. Classically, salsa verde is a salsa or sauce. 
but I'm actually going to use it as a stuffing today. I'm going to spread it on the inside of my mackerel fillets, which are going to be prepared in a rather cunning way. I'm starting with a piquant base of finely chopped garlic, capers and anchovies. The body of my salsa comes from a generous helping of parsley and a good few leaves of basil and tarragon too. It's all blended with a squeeze of lemon, vinegar and a dollop of English mustard. The salsa is actually going to be a stuffing, so I add only enough olive oil to make a firmish paste. Fantastic smells coming off the barbie, Nick. With Nick's char-grilled bream and bass looking irresistible, I'm preparing my mackerel for its salsa verde stuffing. The key is to take a fillet from each side of the fish, but leaving the two fillets joined at the tail. It's a nifty trick, but not hard. After removing the spine, you just need to trim out the small bones along the edge of the belly. There's cheeky little belly bones. Finally, remove the central pin bones by cutting a V-shaped groove down All the middle of the bones. fillet. And the fun thing is, you're left with these little cavities running down the middle of the fillets. And that, of course, is the perfect place to put your stuffing. With both sides stuffed, the fillets come back together and the fishy parcel is secured with a couple of ties of string. Now, I admit that there's a certain amount of fussing and fiddling involved with that, but the joy of this is that once, once you've finished, there isn't a single bone left in the whole fish. The parcels go into a hot pan for a couple of minutes on each side, and with Nick's barbecue fish crisp to perfection, our feast is ready to serve. To some of the delightful people who've made our stay on Alderney such fantastic fun. It's lovely to have you all here. So we'd like to try one of these. How do we do this? Just break that into a second. Oh, Who else is ready for a stuffed mackerel? Salsa verde, green herb. There you go. Swap a blank for it. Is that yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Here we go. Are you ready for a bit of that, Pat? My Japanese-style slow-cooked mackerel brings a touch of hot and sour eastern spice to the party. Simmering away on the boat. Yeah, we'll put a finger in the pot. <laughs> Something a little bit of spicy mackerel. I'll one. try in a minute. Steve, oh, that's you? absolutely wonderful. For a beach barbecue celebration, you can't beat super fresh fish. It's outstanding. It's really nice. And these bountiful islands have proved just how much fabulous fish is out there when you look beyond the old fish shop favourites. Next week, my fishy adventures continue, and I'll be heading north to Scotland and the Inner Hebrides. I'll be ducking under for a sustainable harvest of shellfish, trying out a nifty Scandinavian trick on a side of farmed salmon, and attempting to reinvent fish and chips for the Isle of Skye pipers. Hello, who's the battered pollock? Eleven o'clock tonight on four. Frank Gallagher, legend, shameless drama at about a thousand notches above the rest. Now, next tonight, five mothers in the extraordinary situation of having to say goodbye to their children. It's a new series, The Mummy Diaries.